Okay, so let's let, let's let's use that as the leverage point to talk a little bit about the pharmacology of the plant. Like it has a it has a variety of different alkaloids. I understand um, all of which seem to be related to a core alkal uh, alkaloid called um, mitragynine or something like that. Um, what is the far what is the pharmacology of the plant in the sense of what chemicals are in it? What is its constituents? And then what do we know about how it's affecting our brain when we consume it? Yeah, so that is uh, uh, that is a very interesting uh, in regards to the core alkaloids that we know. We know that these are indole alkaloids. Um, so indole, the indole core structure uh, is preserved in um, some and endogenous molecules that we have that we produce ourselves. So, for example, serotonin as a neurotransmitter has an indole structure. Um, we have also a variety of other psychoactive substances that contain the indole structure. And I do not mean to at all uh, uh, put uh, mitragynin and the other indole alkaloids that are present in um, uh, in kratom on on the same level with uh, some of these other indole ring containing alkaloids sure. uh, like psilocybin uh, for example like psilocybin or lsd as a semi-synthetic uh, but uh, they contain the same structure uh, however they seem to have very different uh, activities when it comes to which uh, receptors they target in the body and and what the resulting effects are. Uh, so when we talk about the two major alkaloids that have been studied, and we, we know at least uh, structurally from, from their structure, we know at least 40 of them. So uh, we currently mainly talk about two that are uh, studied, but there might be much more uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, quantum uh, that we simply do not investigate at the moment very well. But the two that are studied are mitragynin and 7-hydroxymitragynin. Uh, uh, and mitragynin is primarily studied because it's the main alkaloid that is present in uh, the, the, the leaf uh, material. Um, so mitragynin, what, what most people are focusing on is its activity at opioid receptors. Um, and when we, when we when I say activity at opioid receptors is, I mean, it interacts with opioid receptors, it binds to opioid receptors, um, and it acts as a, what we call a partial agonist. And partial agonist means that it doesn't activate all of the opioid receptors it actually binds to. Um, so it, it activates some of them. It doesn't activate all of them. So the best comparison, if anybody would make a comparison, and I, it's it's kind of a little bit, it's, it doesn't fit very well, but uh, is buprenorphine, which is also it's a it's a syn synthetic opioid um, that we use often in the treatment um, of opioid withdrawal um, to to maintain people who are on opioid maintenance therapy. Um, and uh, that is also a partial agonist at opioid receptors. The big difference uh, that distinguishes mitragynin from uh, the opioids like morphine or heroin or uh, even oxycodone, hydrocodone, Percocet and Vicodin, you know, all of these brand names when I talk about just those, um, is what happens after they actually bind to the opioid receptors. So the opioid receptors, when we imagine a cell, let's think biology for a second, um, our biology high school classes, uh, we, we have the cell with the cell wall and uh, the opioid receptors sit in the cell wall basically. And on the outside, uh, um, we have the, the binding side where where our little mitragynin molecule binds to, or our morphine molecule binds to. And then on the inside of the cell wall, uh, there's actually a, a little three-part kind of little trigger or a little switch. Uh, and that little switch is called a G-protein. 
So that little G protein um, basically causes a little cascade of uh, like a domino effect that happens after the receptor is activated. That switch turns on and then this little domino cascade is activated um, upon the receptor being activated. But there's also a secondary cascade that actually happens that most people might not be aware of. And I wasn't aware of it until I learned more about mitragynin and uh, these particular alkaloids. And that is the arrestin, beta arrestin 2 pathway. Um, and the beta arrestin 2 pathway uh, is responsible, it's also it, another domino effect happens after that one is activated. Uh, and, and that actually leads to some of the not so beneficial uh, effects that we often attribute to opioids. So the G protein coupled pathway that I mentioned, the domino effects from there down, uh, leads to the pain relieving effects um, that we want to see, that we want to get out of it. Uh, but the beta arrestin pathway uh, can lead to some of the not so beneficial effects like the respiratory depression, for example. Uh, so slowed breathing that people experience that often leads to these uh, overdose um, incidences where that can also lead to death in some cases, unfortunately. Um, so what is the important distinction is when morphine or oxycodone, hydrocodone um, bind to the opioid receptors, um, then they activate both the G protein receptor cascade and the beta arrestin 2 cascade. When uh, mitragynin binds, what has been confirmed in multiple studies by independent groups so far is that only the G protein coupled pathway is activated, not the beta arrestin 2 pathway. So that's an important distinction. Mm -hmm. We can if you just basically look at um, does it bind to the beta opioid, uh, does it bind to the opioid receptors a molecule? You can study that in a, um, we now have very sophisticated programs that can do that. So you can study that on a computer. You don't ever have to actually go into, uh, into an animal or even into a, a, a cell study. You can do that and the computer will tell you, yes, it binds to the opioid receptor, but it doesn't actually, the computer cannot tell you what happens afterwards, after it binds. Does it activate both the G protein and the beta arrestin 2 pathway? We're not there yet that we can predict which particular uh, downstream, we call that downstream effects, are mediated um, after binding of, of, of a particular molecule to uh, a receptor. Hmm. So it, what I'm understanding here is that there's something unique about the alkaloids in Kratom that bind to opioid receptors providing um, analgesic effects and, and, other, and other effects, euphoria and all the rest, but that it, it doesn't suppress the breathing. So it, it sort of like provides some level of opioid activity without one of the primary dangers that's associated with acute use. That is, that is correct. Yes. That's, that's basically what studies have found so far for mitragynin for seven hydroxy mitragynin. We see that it is a little bit different. Um, we are not certain what the exact mechanism is, but what has been shown in animal studies is uh, that while mitragynin is not a reinforcer. So uh, if you give morphine, if you give an animal a choice, <clears throat> if they want to self-administer morphine repeatedly, they will do so. So uh, basically they have a choice of a water bottle and a choice of, of, of morphine injection or saline injection and, and morphine injection. They will tap the lever that injects morphine, uh, injects morphine. Uh, if you give them a choice of doing mitragynin, they will not repeatedly tap the mitragynin lever. They will not do that. With 7-hydroxymitragynin, 
they will do the same as they do with morphine. So there is a potential for tolerance and dependence development with 7-hydroxymetragynin, which we do not see with mitragynin. Um, and we do not know exactly why that is, because uh, it doesn't look like 7-hydroxymetragynin is also activating the beta-arrestin-2 domino pathway, the, that pathway that uh, is activated uh, once it binds to the opioid receptors. And that would also be a, a bad effect of many of the opioids that they cause that tolerance and dependence development. So there's something about 7-hydroxymetragynin that we do not fully understand yet. So, so the so the seven hydroxy variety is able to does doesn't activate that that beta beta arrestin two pathway was that correct? Correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that the activation of that pathway in other opioids is primarily what's a, what um, is associated to its dependency, but they both create dependency. Yes. So seven hydroxy metragynin also has been shown in animal studies to create uh, tolerance and dependency development, but it doesn't seem to be mediated through the beta arrestin 2 pathway, yes. Hmm, interesting. Um, so, oh, there's two questions. Okay, I'm going to start with this first question, and then I have another one specifically about what you're talking about. When it's activating the the opioid receptors, now, I understand that there's, there's three, is there three different kinds of opioid receptors? One of them's kappa, one of them's mu, and I, the, the third one is delta. Delta. Um, and primarily heroin, morphine, all the rest, it activates with mu, wherein something like salvinorin A from salvia seems to exclusively ap activate kappa opioid receptors. Do we have a sense of which opioid receptors are being activated specifically with, uh, with kratom? So uh, I cannot talk for, for all of Kratom. That's the problem because we primarily look at mitragynin right, right. Uh, and 7 hydroxymitragynin. So uh, for mitragynin, we know that it primarily targets uh, the mu opioid receptors. Um, and then it is a, um, the ooh, I don't want to get this wrong, but it is also a, an agonist at the kappa opioid receptors and I believe an antagonist at the delta opioid receptors, uh, whereas 7 hydroxymetragynin is also an agonist at the mu opioid receptors, but then an antagonist at the kappa and the delta opioid receptors.